1969 turns 50 years old this year. What has that legislation meant for women's athletics in our state? Plus an interview with U.S. Secretary of Agriculture Tom Vilsack, an update on COVID-19 trends in our state, and a deadlock in the legislature over school finance and property taxes. It's all ahead tonight on Speaking of Nebraska. Thanks for joining us on Speaking of Nebraska. I'm Nebraska Public Media News Director Dennis Kellogg. Title IX is the landmark legislation that outlawed discrimination on the basis of sex. Here at Nebraska Public Media, we're reporting on how Title IX has impacted our state as we approach the 50th anniversary of that law. Before we get to our conversation tonight, one of the most visible parts of our society that Title IX has changed is women's sports. Carrie and Devin Amy, who coached the University of Nebraska at Kearney women's basketball team and one of their players, tell us their sport is better because of Title IX, but there's still more work to be done. Easy, find your target, drive your legs. Here we go. Here we go. The Title IX movement and the progression uh, over the last even 20, 25 years since I was you know, in high school, the opportunities that have been provided to, to young girls eh, all the way up you know through college age is is so much more than what it was even when i was younger good roll Haley. i'm so glad that i was born in the time that i'm born in where i get to play full court and i get to play basketball in a super athletic and meaningful and competitive team-oriented way instead of all the restrictions we used to have with girls only being allowed to play on half court and the changes in the rules because of the perceptions of what our bodies could do and I just think it keeps changing and keeps getting better and I can't wait to see what the future has for all these little girls that are just now starting to grow up and they know nothing else except for the WNBA and girls play college sports. I think we're on the verge of hopefully having some uh, really good female coaches break through even on the, on the men's side because there's some unbelievable uh, coaches out there and unbelievable players um, from a female standpoint that need to be given exposure and uh, opportunities. So it's getting better, but for sure, there's been you know, stuff that Carrie tells me you know, 20 years ago and how different it is. It's still, there's still a gap and it. I think we're working on that. Roll! I definitely think that Title IX was the, was the start of, of change. And I think we've gone through some, some decades where that change was happening more drastically and then other you know, decades where it was kind of put on the back burner. And obviously right now uh, with what our country's going through and even social media and the awareness and um, publicity it brings to, to various issues, one being equity um, in sport, uh, I definitely think that that has helped um, and, and definitely we're going to see more and more change, but I don't think we'd be where we're at if we, if we didn't have Title IX. Joining us now, Nancy Grant Colson, a member of one of the University of Nebraska volleyball teams, one of the very first teams, and she went on to teach with Lincoln Public Schools, but thank you for being a part of Speaking Nebraska tonight. You're welcome. Well, um, I want to ask you, you started uh, on the 1976 team, 1975 was the very first team, uh, but volleyball didn't become an NCAA sanctioned sport until after that for a few years, but can you describe to me what it was like playing then and how different was it after a few years after Title IX? Did you yeah. see a difference? Yeah. Um, so I guess, first of all, uh, I accepted a scholarship to the University of Nebraska. Um, it was tuition and fees. Um, so not, we were not on full scholarship at the time. But, um, and as far as the recruitment process, you know, I, Pat Sullivan, who was the head coach my freshman year, um, she came to watch me play in high school gymnasiums a couple times. and. Um, brought Janice Kruger along a couple times, who was a senior um, when I was a freshman, and um, and I got the opportunity to play at the university, and um, it was very exciting for me. Um, 
And uh, I just, uh, I just knew I loved being an athlete. I loved playing sports. I loved volleyball, and I was going to be able to continue to do that. And Title IX not only affects the athletic side, but also the uh, educational side. Uh, it directly impacts student enrollment. Uh, before Title IX, there were more men than women attending college across the country. But around five years after the legislation's inception, more female students attended college, eventually outnumbering men. And that trend still holds true to this day. So was it obvious, Nancy, to you in those years after Title IX that you were seeing more women in the classrooms? Um, I have never been asked that question before. <laughs> I don't think that I've ever really thought of that. Um, I, I guess I can only speak to, you know, my friends and the group of women I knew from uh, high school and, um, and the excitement about going to college and thinking about professional careers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well, uh, when it comes to equal opportunities for female students in the 70s, was did you see any difference between what you experienced on the volleyball court and what was happening in the classroom? Was either athletics or the educational side a little bit ahead when it came to adapting to Title IX? Um, I, you know, I, I don't necessarily remember the, you know, prominently the. The title, uh, the title of being a student athlete, being sort of prominently mm -hmm. a part of our experience. Um, but we certainly, academics was very important to us, and um, athletics was very important to us, and we worked constantly to negotiate both and, um, and, and navigate both. And, you know, we had, like, we didn't have training tables or study halls. I mean, we really, as, a, as team members, we really kind of helped each other navigate all of that. And I want to ask you, because you talked with us for a previous story about how even traveling to games right. was a, a, lot, a lot different than what we see today. Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, um, during the season, of course, I remember clearly I... I had took my first airplane ride as an 18-year-old on the volleyball team, and we flew to um, L.A. We flew to UCLA for um, a huge tournament. And um, I think the same was true for many of the women on the team. Flying and traveling across the United States was not something that we had done a whole lot of. So that was cool to experience that. And then in the spring, when we were out of season, we... Um, the university, there was not a whole lot provided from the university for us to travel. Terry had to make special arrangements. Terry Some, Pettit. Terry Pettit had yes. to make special arrangements. He, um, he made uh, con contacts in the community. And I recall us driving our own cars sometimes. Some of the players driving our own cars to go to spring tournaments like at K-State or someplace like that. Yeah, and you said you even learned to drive a stick shift because you were well, driving one of the cars back home, right? Well, Terry, Terry <laughs> called me after that segment and said he does not remember that. So <laughs> we've had a little different memory on that. <laughs> uh, what, what about facilities? Uh, did you notice a huge stark difference between men's facilities and women's facilities? What I do remember, oh, uh, the weight room, without a doubt. Mm -hmm. um, our locker room and our weight room was in the basement of the Coliseum. And... Um, they were tiny. They were they were tiny, and um, and I do remember thinking like sometimes I felt like even when we were practicing, there was sort of like a sometimes there was sort of like a, a peek in by some male athletes, sort of like, what, who are you people and what are you doing here? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So there was all you know, but again, we we didn't know any different really, except to have just enough equipment yeah. and just enough space to have a locker for your gear and uh, equipment, uh, lifting equipment that was sort of just enough. Yeah, uh, and so since those playing days of yours back in the 70s, how would you describe the changes that you've watched in the sport of volleyball over the years? Yeah, um, so we, we bought our own shoes, we washed our own clothes, we um, set up chairs in the Coliseum. Um, this was basically the people in the audience were our families and our best friends. And um, so we set up the chairs that ringed the court. We took down the chairs afterwards. <laughs> um, we really, you know, like we owned pretty much everything that was 
a part of our volleyball experience. Wow. Um, and I have to ask you, as someone uh, who was one of the athletes and coaches who struggled to get the Husker volleyball program on the map and moving, uh, do you ever look at amazement at the heights that the program has reached in 2022? Yes and no. Terry always had, Terry always had a vision. Um, I, you know, I just like he was, he was that, he was that type of person who looked around. I, I think I said this in the other interview. He looked around the corner and he had a vision and he made connections and he was. A, I just knew growth would happen under him. And he also, it was really important to him that we were taken seriously as athletes, that we weren't girls playing a sport, mm -hmm. that we were athletes to be taken seriously. And I remember a conversation we had one time. Um, please don't dispute me on this, Terry. <laughs> we had a conversation one time that went something like, I was confused why we were called the Lady Huskers. That did not make sense to me. Why weren't we just called the Huskers? Mm -hmm. um, that is still something that is happening in the United States, and I wish it would change. So do you think that the, today's Husker female athletes have any idea about what you had to go through and your teammates had to go through to earn some of the things that are now just commonplace in women's athletics? I, you know, I can't really speak to, to that, what the coaching staff does or does not talk about with the players. But I do, you know, there have been alumni events and and bringing pre, uh, previous teams together. Um, and so I do think that there is that thread of um, keeping the players mindful mm -hmm. of who, uh, who came before you and, you know, keeping them humble in that sense too, that they're, this, you are standing upon the shoulders of women who, who built this and um, who were navigating a time that throwing like a girl was still a common, common statement, a, a derogatory statement. Yeah, very well put. Just about 30 seconds or so, and I just wanna ask you one question. Is there something out there, because I know this process isn't over, that you think needs to happen from the NCAA standpoint to bring that equity to women's athletics? Well, good grief, all we have to do is pay attention to what happened during the, the, the basketball tournament. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, With I, the weightlifting the, yeah, facilities. Yeah, the, 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 the facilities, the facilities. access to the facilities yeah. and, and the quality of the facilities. Um, yeah, uh, I think that's a pretty glaring example that um, there's still much work to be done. Yeah, no doubt about it, there is. And uh, it's been great talking with you. Nancy Grant Colson, a uh, member of the 1976 Husker volleyball team and several seasons after that. Thanks for coming back and sharing your experience about Husker volleyball and Title IX. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you. All right. Well, you can watch the full story of Title IX's impact on the UNK women's basketball program on an upcoming episode of Nebraska Stories this spring. And don't miss any of Nebraska Public Media's coverage of Title IX's 50th anniversary. You can find that at nebraskapublicmedia.org slash Title IX. Joining us now is Tom Vilsack, the U.S. Secretary of Agriculture, and I should point out the former governor of Iowa, so knows the Midwest very well. Secretary Vilsack, thanks for taking time to visit with us on Speaking of Nebraska. Uh, happy to be with you today. Well, Nebraska, as you know, is a beef state, and meatpacking is an important part of that cycle, but uh, four companies control 85% of that particular market. Your administration recently launched a new online tool for farmers and ranchers to report unfair and anti-competitive practices. We also have Senators Fisher and Senator Grassley dealing with the pricing side, that we're, uh, the problems we're seeing with the market. What do you think it's going to take, and is it a priority to restore that balance in those beef markets? Well, it absolutely is a priority uh, for many reasons. First and foremost, to be make sure that our farmers and ranchers who are working incredibly hard to produce that beef uh, are adequately and fairly compensated. It's also important for consumers to be able to have choice and know that when they go into the grocery store, uh, that they're able to purchase a product that is supporting the local and regional economy. Uh, and I think it's also important from an economic uh, development and jobs perspective. The ability to produce uh, more processing capacity will mean more rural jobs. And finally, I think we learned during the pandemic of the necessity of our food system, not only to be efficient, but also to be resilient. 
And I want to get your thoughts on a new processing plant that's under development in western Nebraska in North Platte. The cattlemen of that area have banded together and are a few years away from processing 1,500 cattle a day. Do you think Nebraska and the rest of the country need more of these small processing plants? Uh, we do. Uh, and I think uh, the program that we've announced uh, and, and later this month will provide more specifics on it. Uh, I, I think we'll address uh, some of the capital challenges that many of these facilities face as they try to get up and going. Uh, we believe there is an opportunity for uh, very small uh, and mid-sized operations uh, to dot the landscape, to provide those jobs, to provide more market opportunities and competition, more choice for consumers. Uh, and we're anxious to see uh, as this grant program and loan program is unfolded, uh, the interest. We think uh, uh, there are ready, uh, shovel ready projects, uh, perhaps similar to the one you mentioned, uh, that could uh, use a little bit of a boost and, and we're prepared to provide that soon. We're speaking with the United States Secretary of Agriculture, Tom Vilsack, and uh, a couple of months ago, we spoke with former Nebraska Governor and also Senator and Agriculture Secretary, Mike Johans, and we asked him about trade in the Biden administration. And his comment was that he wished he was wrong, but he wasn't confident trade would be at the top of the agenda for this administration. Obviously, um, former Secretary Joannes is a Republican as well, we should point out. But what would you say to former Secretary Joannes about the priority of trade in this administration? Well, Mike is a good friend. Uh, and the first thing I would point out to him is that uh, during the Obama administration, a record agriculture uh, export a record was set. Uh, that, that stood until uh, this year uh, when in the Biden administration we set yet another record of agricultural exports and the current year is projected to break that record yet again. Uh, so first and foremost, we're seeing record exports. Secondly, you know, it's important when we talk about trade that we create when, within the American public an understanding and a trusting relationship about trade. I think many Americans think that trade works uh, against America and not for America. So it's important to reestablish that trust. Now, how do we do that? By enforcement. Uh, that's why uh, we successfully took Canada uh, to task under the USMCA for uh, not living up to that trade agreement's responsibilities with reference to dairy. A lot of Nebraska farmers are keeping their eye on fertilizer prices. The Texas A&M study showed those could jump by as much as 80% this year. Is there anything that you can do and how closely are you watching those fertilizer prices? Well, it's a difficult situation, no, no doubt, for farmers. Uh, what we can do at USDA uh, is make sure that farmers are equipped with the ability to make the right decisions about the level and amount of fertilizer they need. Uh, we continue to invest in research uh, in sensor technology uh, so that farmers can better understand with more precision uh, how much fertilizer is needed. I was recently at Iowa State University uh, talking to uh, some scientists there that are developing a sensor for corn um, and they tell me that based on their preliminary research, that as much as 30% of our corn acres may not require any fertilizer at all. Uh, so I think it's important for us to continue to invest in that type of research. And Secretary Vilsack, I want to ask you about a major announcement from the USDA involving climate smart ag products. You're setting aside about a billion dollars for public and private entities to apply for those funds. Why such a huge investment in this particular area? Well, I think it's important for American agriculture to provide a leadership opportunity for farmers and ranchers to meet the market where it is and where it is headed. Uh, whether it's the domestic uh, food industry or whether it's uh, exports, there is a growing demand for sustainably produced uh, agricultural commodities. And we want to make sure that farmers in the U.S. and ranchers in the U.S. and forested landowners in the U.S. are equipped to meet that demand where it is and to uh, lead that effort. Yeah, we'll definitely keep our eye on that particular project. It sounds like a, a, an exciting one that we'll continue to monitor. Secretary Tom Vilsack, the U.S. Secretary of Agriculture, thank you so much for joining us on Speaking of Nebraska. You're welcome. And our full interview with Secretary Vilsack and our conversation with Nancy Grant Colson about Title IX are available on our website. Just go to nebraskapublicmedia.org slash speaking of Nebraska. And join the conversation on social media. Find us on Facebook and Twitter at Nebraska Public Media News. Dr. Bob Rahner, a family physician and the president of Partnership for a Healthy Lincoln is here to break down the pandemic and the latest that's going on with that. Dr. Rahner, thank you for being a part of Speaking of Nebraska. Welcome. 
want to take a look to begin with at some mm -hmm. trends with COVID. COVID-19 cases are down 71% over the last two weeks. So do you think we're to the point where we can say that the pandemic is winding down and we can, we can see the end of it yet? Yeah, we hope so. I mean, the cases are dropping and usually hospitalizations follow about two weeks later. And we're already seeing the hospitalizations drop, especially in Omaha, a little bit in Lincoln, hopefully the rest of the state as well. Uh, and so that's a good sign. So, you know, if it keeps dropping, uh, we can kind of look to New York and New Jersey because they started first and see if we follow their trends. That then, yeah, things are looking good as long as we don't hit another new big variant. That's so. the key. That's always the key. Now, you brought up hospitalization. That's mm -hmm. always been a really important metric since the very beginning of the pandemic. And as you mentioned, those hospitalizations are starting to drop a little bit. Is there any reason to believe that that trend won't continue to decline in the coming weeks? Uh, right now, no, because the cases keep dropping. We've got a lot of secondary sources to check that. For example, school absences and positives, University of Nebraska's positives, every, everything's dropping across the board. So that, that really is an optimistic sign. Uh, hopefully enough immunity too that even though our vaccination rates could be a little better uh, that this will continue and so and then again like we like I said we look toward the to the east and see how what's happening there their numbers are dropping the question is will they drop all the way back down to sort of like a, we almost had a normal summer last mm -hmm. summer uh, fingers crossed that that's where we'll hit in a few more weeks so the mask mandate in Lincoln was extended for two weeks in Omaha for another week does the data show us that masking has been an effective tool or is it a tool that really hasn't worked as well as we thought it would Actually, I'd say it's worked very well. I mean, our school data backs that up. We've had contact tracing uh, where we had, like, for example, 500 high risk co contacts, and out of that, only 15, 20. Uh, so very effective. Uh, my wife is a physician who's made it through the whole pandemic seeing sick people wearing a mask and hasn't had COVID once. And so, yes, the masks work. Uh, the biggest misconception is there's different kinds of masks. It's not a one size thing. So cloth masks, pretty helpful. If I have coronavirus, I'm wearing a cloth mask, helps protect you a little bit. But the other way around, not quite that effective. But we have the surgical masks and now really pretty good access to another. I, have, I actually use what's called a KF94, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, those are actually very effective. And there was just a study for the CDC showing that that's also protective of the wearer as well. And it can, it can make an argument now that with enough uh, drop in case rates that, that if you're immunocompromised, for example, you may still need that. But the rest of us may not need masks in a couple more weeks. And along those lines, is there any truth to the fact that as we see these numbers start to go down, we should be lifting these restrictions so when we need people to go through this process again, that they'll be more willing to do that? Yes, and I think that is one of the good arguments that you don't want to wait till things get to zero. That's too long. Uh, and, and we're not going to make coronavirus go completely away. It's probably like influenza where it's going to be with us for the long haul. And so it may come back again. And so I tell people it's like, you know, when do you wear a raincoat? Well, you're wearing a raincoat when it's raining, but you don't wear it when it's sunny. So let's look at those rates. I think the biggest thing that would help us is if, if we could at least have come to some consensus about what that rate should be. And there's a lot of differences of opinion across the country from the CDC on down on that. It'd be nice to have a, a clear metric that all of us can get behind. And so we're coming off some of the highest numbers of the entire pandemic for cases mm -hmm. in particular. Um, and that means there's a lot of people out there with some of the natural immunity that's mm -hmm. been built up to the virus. So, so do we change our messaging when it comes to vaccinations and boosters because there's people out there with this immunity? Yes, and there's actually some studies now that a second infection actually is pretty highly protective. The, the problem we have with, with Omicron is that it escaped immunity. So even though you may have the Wuhan or the A strain, uh, alpha strain a, a year ago, it didn't protect as much against the Omicron strain. So when you add vaccination rates of about you know, two thirds of Nebraskans, a little more than a third of them even have a booster shot with people who've had probably two infections. If you add those two together, it might be enough that we've hit sort of a herd immunity threshold as long as we don't get a new variant that escapes some of that immunity. And we just have under a minute, but um, what have we learned about therapeutics through all of this? Well, good. We've made a lot of advances there. So in addition to vaccines, we actually have quite a few uh, medications out there. Uh, some of the monoclonal antibody infusions are very effective. We've got a, several pills, uh, Paxlovid and Molnupiravir. Uh, they've been limited uh, quantities so far, but uh, within one to two months, we're going to have really uh, a lot of quantity there. So even people who are immunocompromised, they've got another backup plan, for example. And then we also have a, a protective antibody you can get called Evushel, which will protect an immunocompromised person for about six months. So we've just got a lot of tools in our toolbox now that I think really could push us into, quote, returning to normal here in the next weeks to a month or two. Well, that's our goal is to return to normal, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Thank you. Dr. Bob Ronner, who is the president and founder of Partnership for a Healthy Lincoln and a family physician himself, thank you for being with us. You're welcome. All right. For the latest pandemic news, you can visit our website. That's nebraskapublicmedia.org slash coronavirus.
The Nebraska legislature is about a third of the way through its 2022 session, and Nebraska Public Media News legislative reporter Fred Knapp is here to bring us up to speed on the latest developments. And, uh, Fred, we've been following efforts regarding school finance and property taxes. Those don't seem to be going too well. Well, they're at a pretty much of a stalemate. Uh, earlier this week, uh, Senator Tom Breezy had his bill, which would have limited school property tax increases to 2.5% a year or inflation, whichever is higher. That was filibustered to death. Now they're talking to, about Senator Lynn Wall's proposal to uh, vastly increase school aid. And uh, the proponents of the previous bill for caps are filibustering against it because they say there aren't strong enough limits on school spending in there. There was also a public hearing on a story that we've done a lot of reporting on. Governor Ricketts uh, proposing for a canal to take water from the South Platte River in Colorado and bring it into Nebraska. Did we see support for that project that has quite a hefty price tag? Well, it does. It's $500 million officially. And uh, the governor testified for it at the public hearing, but he had an almost defensive rationale. He said, we're not going to get any more water out of this. What we're trying to do is prevent a loss of up to 90 percent of what we're currently getting as the Front Range grows uh, in the Denver area. But under the interstate compact that came into effect in the 1920s, Nebraska isn't entitled to the water unless it builds this canal. So, but there are big questions about the timing of it. Director of Natural Resources Tom Riley said it would take 18 months to 36 months to design and then another five to seven years to build if the legislature approves the money. And are we talking about any alternatives possibly to the proposed canal? Well, the Sierra Club testified against it and their rationale was uh, uh, it's a disruption to the natural ecosystem and, uh, uh, and it'll harm uh, birds and fishes at the, at the, in order to grow more coin and, corn and soybeans. Um, Senator Justin Wayne talked about the possibility of renegotiating the compact with Colorado to get a certain amount of water and putting a cert, parking a certain amount of money to show them we're serious. So, uh, but uh, Senator Hilgers said he didn't like that approach. This is a real request for real money and it's not in the Appropriations Committee preliminary budget. So it's very much up in the air. And we've talked a lot about taxes. Next week, we're going to be talking income taxes. Right. There's a proposal that uh, Senator Linehan has to lower the top corporate and individual rates from just above 7% to just below 6%. And that's likely to have uh, a lot of support, but we'll see. All right. We will see next week. Thanks, Fred, for covering the legislature. And Fred does just that, keeping us informed on what's happening in the legislature each day. Listen for his radio updates at 545 and 745 weekday mornings and 545 in the evening on Nebraska Public Media. You can read his stories each day on our website at nebraskapublicmedia.org slash news. That's all for this week on Speaking of Nebraska. Thanks to Nancy Grant Colson, Tom Vilsack, and Dr. Bob Rahner for joining us. And thanks to Fred Knapp for his reporting. Next week on Speaking of Nebraska, join us for a conversation with former U.S. Secretary of Defense and North Platte native Chuck Hagel about our nation's defense and tense times abroad. I'm Dennis Kellogg. Thanks for spending some time with us. We'll see you next week.